Good morning. Hi, everybody. What's up, y'all? How is it going? Hope y'all are having the best day so far. I'm sure me and all of the other incredible women on stage have been popping in and out of all of the sessions that have been happening, and they have been incredible. Your girl's feeling inspired. I'm feeling all types of feels. <laughs> I'm having a great day, but I'm really excited to sit down, do our session today on sex and relationship as it pertains to body confidence. I am joined by my friends Alicia, Luna, and Alex. I will let you guys take it away really quick. Give yourselves a little intro. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go. I am a 31-year-old woman who went viral on TikTok and has been passionate about my body and my relationship and humor and just facing those things head on. Um, and I have been presented with an incredible platform to meet some really beautiful people and um, exist and help other people exist authentically. Yay! Hey, what's up, Alicia? Luna, go ahead. Hi, I'm Luna Matadas, and I'm a sex and pleasure educator. So I get the joy of talking about dildos and butts and threesomes and all the things. And I've been teaching for about 10 years, and I'm totally fangirling this panel. Like, this is amazing to be surrounded by all these, like, amazing people and voices. So thank you for having me here. Of course. Of course. I mean, I say, of course, like, this is like, I put it on. I didn't. <laughs> um, Alex, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Stacy. I'm known as Wheelchair Punzel on Instagram. I'm 27 years old and I have spinal muscular atrophy type two, which is a rare genetic disability. And I'm very passionate about disabled body confidence and just empowering everybody no matter what type of body you live in. We love to see it. I guess I also realized that I was just like, everybody else introduced themselves and I didn't. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, I'm Carly. I am a lifestyle content creator and influencer. I also host a top five sexuality podcast called Hey Bitches, where we talk about sex, dating, relationships, all of that good stuff. I also do, you know, all the other social medias. I talk a lot about body confidence, body positivity, and I do a lot of it through my embarrassing dating stories, but also a lot of dance videos. <laughs> um, like I said, I'm very excited to talk about sex and relationships today. It's a fun topic. I'm very excited. We have such an incredible, you know, so many incredible women up here to share their plethora ooh, and depth of, of knowledge. And um, I'm really excited to be on here with you guys. Uh, before we pop in into our whole like little round table, you guys who are listening in the audience, make sure same drill situation, drop your questions. That way we can get them in the chat and then we can pull them up closer to the end of the session. So if you have anything, feel free, drop them in Drop them in a little chat and we will we'll chit chat them after we have our we've answered our predetermined questions. You know what I mean? So make sure you drop those in the in the chat. But I guess that's enough rambling from me for now. <laughs> um, let's get into some of the questions that were posed to us previously to this live. And the first one is, you know, what is everybody's advice on navigating a new sexual relationship, especially with a super fit partner? I would love to know whoever wants to answer first. I don't want to be the person that's like you. <laughs> I I mean, I can go with this because I feel like that's part of my allure and how things went a little bit crazy um, for Scott and I. Um, he is super physically fit. He's always been super physically fit. And I've been on this journey with my body, with my relationship with exercise, with my relationship with food. And it, my body has always been the one that has changed. So I've been, you know, we met in high school. So it was as new as a relationship could possibly be. So I was in like, at the time, my I was 16 and in a 16 year old body and I hated it then. And then now I'm, you know, 31 in my body. And it's not necessarily pertaining to a new relationship with somebody who is physically fit. I think when you're looking at the difference like that, what I've come to realize is that it really doesn't matter. It has taken me a long time to get to a point where I would, I've been both sizes. And when I was 127 pounds, my sex life was not 
as good as my sex life is now at 31 and the most confident that I've been. And I'm living in a plus size body. Um, but a lot of that for me came with actually owning the fact that I was living in a plus size body and being okay with that and understanding what worked for me, what worked for my body and how we were going to work well together. Um, so that's been, that's been the biggest part of my journey is just as, as easy as it sounds, just realizing that it really doesn't matter. And that difference in size, as long as you're communicating and as long as you're having those co types of conversations about what you both need and expect in your sexual relationship, then that size is not going to be an issue. I love that. I love that you really highlighted communication is key. I think that's a big thing, obviously in all sexual relationships, but I think that a lot of women do feel self-conscious when they are bigger than their partner because a lot of people, I don't know, maybe feel, this is me speaking from personal experience, I felt I've been feeling less desirable if I was larger than my partner. And it's it really does boil down, like you said, to communication. Luna, I would love to know if you have any other you know things to add on that, being a, a pleasure coach and sexual educator. I'm sure that you hear this question a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a popular question. And I think it wraps into all these other ideas of sexual attractiveness or desire that we're sold. And so only these bodies are allowed to claim that they're sexy and that they get more pleasure out of being more physically um, like in line with what conventional beauty standards are. And we know that all of this is like white supremacy and patriarchy and ableism and transphobia and ageism. And yet it's so powerful and it's really rooted in our bodies. So I think what Alicia mentioned around communication can also be extended to, you know, like name these things for yourself. Like, what do you think is gonna happen if they see your flabby arm? Or if your tummy feels like it's taking up more space than their torso, or if your butt is jiggling and knowing what's happening for you can also allow you to regulate those feelings, but also give your partner tools to help you regulate. So if they notice you're getting distracted during sex because you're worried about like, like sucking in and like, this is how I'm going to get pleasure, you know, like that's, they're going to be like, babe, like breathe like breathe with me, like you're here, like this is, and so giving them the tools to be empathetic with you also helps you be more tender and compassionate with these parts of yourselves that have operated in these really violent systems. I, uh, I think that is a very good point to bring up and uh, that was an incredible answer. Thank you so much, Alex. I would love to know if you have any insight on this as well, just from your personal experience. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, it's a lot different because I'm disabled and even if I wanted to change my body by dieting or going to the gym, I don't really have that option. So I've always had this idea of radically accepting who I am in my body at a very young age. And I'm like, if I have the ability to do that, then I'm gonna go for the hottest guys with the abs. Like I'm not like, oh, well, I have a disabled body. So they're like above me. I'm just like, yeah, I am disabled AF and like, Shirley with the abs, come over here. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's a really interesting dynamic with these other types of people that are able-bodied that have the option to perhaps engage in these like toxic beauty standards that I literally cannot engage in even if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, I've always just had this radical acceptance over my disabled body and I've definitely grown to try and be more confident in intimate situations because I've definitely been more kind of reserved with that. But if it's like surface level, I'm very confident, but it definitely is hard to gain that confidence in more intimate situations. I love the idea of radical confidence. I think that is such like a cool thing. And I think that's an awesome takeaway. I love that. And it actually segues very well <laughs> into our second question, which is, you know, how do you find confidence when you are bigger or you're different than your body? And Alex, I think that you answered this perfectly about the, the radical confidence and really being 100% confident in yourself and knowing you're you're hot and knowing you're you're the shit and, you know. Mr. Man with the abs can, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? But um, Luna, Alicia, I would love to hear from you guys as well as, you know, how do you find confidence when you are bigger than your partner? Um, I think that, that 
it like it has for me it has nothing to do with my partner i i i buy i i never used to purchase lingerie and then all of a sudden i started buying lingerie and i think everybody originally was like oh i posted a photo and somebody said you know you should keep this between you and your husband and i'm like i don't buy lingerie for my husband i buy lingerie because i look good in lingerie like i i spent so long not enjoying my body and feeling like I was a sexual human being that when I finally, you know, had that aha moment and started buying things for myself to make myself feel sexual, it was separate from my husband. It was completely separate. Um, and like, I, I'm slowly getting to a point where I'm super confident to talk about you know, self pleasure. Like I, it's not, I, you know, masturbation in general was something that, you know, I've always done, but I never did it for me to know what I liked. I never did it to understand what felt good. And when I started to like take ownership over feeling sexy in my body and knowing what I wanted, then it became more of an an intimate, more of a sexual or like a pleasurable thing when we were having sex because I... Oh no. Oh, I think we flared with secondary. Did we? Oh, we're good, we're good. Yeah, are we? Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I, once I started to own it separate from my partner, and I think that that is, we, we try to always attribute our sexuality or our confidence to the person that we're with, when it really has nothing to do with them. It has to do with us. So it, it, uh, once I started to realize that I am my own sexual being without him, it made it easier for me to be confident when I was with him. I love that. I love that. Figuring out in yourself before anybody else. I love that message. Luna, I would love to hear also too, you know, how do you find confidence when you are bigger than your partner? Yeah, I think because when we're bigger, we're constantly trying to catch up to uh, a vision of sexy or be validated by our appearance. And that's just not gonna happen for me in, in this world. Like this world doesn't like fat bodies. It doesn't like aging bodies. It doesn't like bodies of color. It doesn't like all these kinds of things. So um, once I let go of that and started building this erotic relation to myself that included things like, like Alicia mentioned, like masturbation, but also really included this idea that I have a right to pleasure, that pleasure is mine and that it is so much more about what I feel like versus what I look like. Like what I look like is actually the least interesting thing about me. And, and so really stepping into sensual self-care practices every day. And that might mean, you know, meeting your gaze in the mirror while you're washing your hands and just like giving yourself like a wink, you know, like permission to feel cute today, granted, and really working to tap into your senses as these portals of pleasure during sex. And so if you get stuck in your head, if you're someone that gets distracted and you're like, you really want to be in your body, the sensual capability of your body is actually what what's you know going to anchor you in that erotic moment and free you from this self-judgment so what feels good what tastes good what smells good what looks good in this moment and focusing in on those things can actually help you feel more relaxed have more fun and stop worrying about like this perfection idea i love that i love that um for me personally how i gain confidence when i am bigger than my partner i think that a lot of it comes down to uh, a topic that we've talked about often already, which is communication. But sometimes when I when I feel insecure about being the larger person in this intimate relationship, I actually really communicate with them and I say, "Hey, you know, I'm having some some personal issues. That doesn't mean I like I'm not attracted to you or I don't want to do this with you. I just need some reassurance, you know. And I think it's not." bad to ask for reassurance from your partner, especially in a sexual intimate setting. Because if I'm constantly feeling like, oh my God, I can't believe this, or oh my God, I did this, or da da da, da like I won't be enjoying myself, which means they probably won't either. And I think that getting that communication across at first and being like, hey, like I'm gonna need you to, you know, maybe we maybe we got some good sexual affirmations going on like mid act. Like I I need it to feel like, you know, I am desired by you because in my head, like my brain is attacking itself and being like, you're not desirable to this person. So, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with the verbal affirmations. We can think it, we can think it, but it also means a lot more to coming from our partners. And so I am a big communications person in that type of sense. Um, 
Luna, like you said earlier, you are um, a sex and pleasure educator. What are some common issues that you get from people, from your clients around body confidence? And what advice do you have for us? Yeah, I think one of the the biggest ones, I mean, I teach so many different things, but the, the sexual confidence class is by far the most popular class. So that's just to reassure everyone that like, this is our common suffering. This is like, we all learn the same shit. And so we're all trying to unlearn and cope with it and navigate around it. And so if you feel sexually unconfident, I try to reassure people that, you know, this doesn't mean that somehow you're dysfunctional, or it doesn't mean that you are somehow not sexy or never going to be sexy. And most people, People come in to my classes and practice wanting to learn like oh what's the pose to be sexy or like what lingerie to wear to be sexy and those are great like those are, are wonderful decorative things for your nakedness that's awesome but what we really want to work on is like um, kind of conjuring this this confidence and so I tend to reassure people that you know sexual confidence isn't a really about a look that it is so much about feeling like you belong in your erotic desires and so I got away more selfish when I started to get sexually confident and I walked into tinder dates being like you know like you know I'm a goddess like why are you approaching a goddess without an offering like what is this nonsense like you know like I want I want mine yeah <laughs> And so I teach people how to ask for what they want and how to communicate desire, how to receive rejection peacefully. And we never learned this in high school. Like all we learned in high school was pretty much like reproductive anatomy around sexual health, right? We didn't learn to talk about our fantasies. And I get a lot of clients who are interested in kink and building confidence in kink. And kink is a great place to do that because it's sensation focused. It is definitely, you have to communicate in kink. And so even if you're like, I'm not kinky, but you know, it's a great place to kind of anchor yourself in those sensations we're talking about. I love that. That is a very good answer. I also, from now on, I'm showing up to all my Tinder dates being like, what is the offering? <laughs> yeah, what is the offering? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like, literally, I'm like, what, what, what is the offering? I love that. Yeah. That's so funny. Great. Yeah, and it's not your dick pic. I don't want your dick pic. Like, <laughs> that is not the offering. <laughs> I love that, though. I think that that is really incredible advice, and I'm, I'm very happy that you shared that with us. Um, this next question we have, it actually, Alex, this one is for you. Um, as a disabled person, what are ways that an able-bodied partner can support you and make you feel comfortable in an intimate setting? Yeah, this is such a great question, and I feel like I'm still finding the answers to this because, like I was saying earlier, on a surface level, I'm very confident with like surface level intimacy, but anything more than that, I start having all this internalized ableism and kind of going back to like thinking, oh yeah, I'm not desirable to do this thing, but I'm desirable to do this thing that's more surface level. So I feel like I've really been unpacking this and what would be useful for an able-bodied person to make me feel more comfortable in a more intimate situation would be just like giving me like, like, I don't know, not like validation, but a little bit, like just making me feel comfortable with having a really open line of communication. Because when you're disabled, you obviously need more assistance. You, it's like way more deep than if you were to be able-bodied. Um, and there, that requires a lot more, um, you know, communication. And so I think communication and just like, having that open line would be just so helpful. And I, when I'm like looking for different guys and talking to guys, I make sure that like they're aware of my needs. I think that's really important too. It's just being really upfront about the situation, like what my mobility is, what my capabilities are, what I'm comfortable with and just having open communication. I love that. I think a lot of, you know, something that I'm gleaning from this conversation is a lot of it boils down to communication. A lot of it, mm -hmm. whether you're small, large, disabled, able-bodied, whatever it is, it's it's communication, and that makes it so much better for you and for your partner. So, I love that. I think that, like I said, I think that asking for affirmations from a partner in a sexual setting is not a bad thing at all, I, especially. I, I, I yeah. When you said that, I was like, that is amazing. Like, I definitely think I could use that tool for sure. 
<laughs> well, we love to see it. I love affirmations. You know what? Unsurprisingly, it's my love language, but, <laughs> um, but moving on. Um, another question that we have is, you know, how do I start a new relationship when I don't feel confident in my own skin? Um, I would love to hear, let's start with you, Luna, about this. Yeah, I think I think that's really challenging because there's already so many new things about this relationship and things that you are being vulnerable to and possibly being judged by and self-judging yourself about it. So there's a lot of you on display. And I think it's really important to walk into that feeling like, you know, no matter what happens here, that I'm always going to return to a place of, of peace in, in myself and so that I can come back to this. And I think that's where your affirmations can really come in. Um, mine are, I'm beautiful, I'm enough, and I have everything I need. And so I get disappointed when stuff doesn't work out, but I don't reach those levels of devastation anymore. I don't reach those, like, it doesn't touch my self-worth in the same way. And so I think it's important that we build up this, this resilience of being able to self-regulate in addition to um, being able to co-regulate with partners through communication and reassurance and all those kinds of things. But the reality is, is that people aren't always going to show up for us in the way that, that we want them to. So having boundaries about what's going to happen if I'm treated in a way that doesn't feel good. So am I going to communicate about it? Am I going to walk away? Am I going to say something? Am I going to seek support? You know, finding whatever your tools are so that it isn't so dependent on, I'm going to tell you to treat me this way. And then if you don't, like, I'm kind of screwed. And, and really building that, that support system that's internal, but also external into it. I love I also think it's really that. I also think it's like really important too, like with that question specifically is about getting into new relationships and not feeling good about your body. I've been in a relationship for 14 years and my relationship with my body has changed since day one to today and it will change until my, you know, last day on this earth. And I think it's so important. Um, like Luna said, like finding those moments to properly communicate where you're at and understand how you feel and not depending on anybody else for those, those types of, you know, and not taking how you feel about your body out on your partner. And I, you know, I've been through the ringer with my body. I've been to a point where, you know, I felt so crappy about myself that I just assumed my husband also felt the same way it, because if I felt that way, there was no way he didn't also feel that way. And it put a strain on our relationship because I was putting words in his mouth. I was telling him how he felt about me. And I was assuming that that's, you know, the way that I looked at myself was how he looked, but that's never changed. The man has loved me since day one. And no matter where my body has been and or has not been, how he cared about me never changed, but how I allowed him to care about me and how I allowed him to love me that's what changed based off of my relationship with my body so it's important to recognize when you're getting in a new relationship but it's also important to recognize that you can be six years deep and completely change how you feel about your body for the better and and for the worse depending on the things that you're going through and so I think it's super important again to realize that you have to find those those ways to cope and understand internally and not put that on to your partner as well and again going back to that c word we've been using all all session is communicating and having those conversations we love good guy love good guy scott <laughs> <laughs> he's incredible um i think that you know the, the c word is funny because it, it that is really you know a big thing that it, it does boil down to i think that for me when I was really unconfident of starting new relationships because I had gone through, you know, a sudden weight gain and a sudden life change and like all of this. And I had gone from being a professional cheerleader, a professional dancer for like 17 years and being the most fit that I ever was to not anymore. It was a, it was very like culture shocky for me. And I really struggled with going back into dating and, and relationships. But I think that when I started to kind of set boundaries, like Luna said, for how people can treat me is when I started also to become more confident. Because for me, I could be like, oh, one of my actual biggest insecurities was my back rolls. When I first like started getting back rolls, I was like, oh my God, I never want to see a like, I never want a guy to see me like from behind when we have sex or something like that. Cause I was really insecure. And I think that the communication there about setting boundaries being like, Hey, I'm not comfortable with this right now. Like as we deepen our actual connection, 
we can continue our our intimate connection because i think that too like you really have to when you are struggling with your your body and your body confidence and your body image it's a lot easier to feel better about it when you do have oh no am i frozen oh there we go um it's a lot better to uh have that that deeper understanding and communication and i guess emotional intimacy first so you can feel a lot better sexually and showing off your body and basically being vulnerable in, in front of someone if it's somebody that you don't have that connection with or like any connection with really at all then you know you're probably gonna hate it and it's gonna suck and you're gonna feel so bad and it's not gonna be a good time so i think that like luna said setting boundaries of like how you expect people to treat you i think is very important for you know feeling confident in your own skin when you are starting a new relationship Alex, I would love if you have any insight on this, anything you'd like to share as well. I think for me, um, I've definitely been in like several different relationships with men and I'm the most comfortable with certain men that just like don't make my disability a big deal. And I could tell, I, I love reading people and I definitely like hyper focus on people reading me. So if I could tell like a man is a little bit apprehensive about my disability or something like that, it just makes me uncomfortable. And I have been in so many situations with guys that just like are su super comfortable with it. And I'm obviously super comfortable, super comfortable with it. So when they are, it just makes me even that much more comfortable. Um, so I think just finding different people that are open to the idea of disability and they're not like super closed off from it. And like, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I think that it definitely is almost like a good judge of, of it's an easy way to judge somebody's character and how they'll treat you in the long run type of thing. Absolutely. If they're already off put there, you know, it's probably not going to get better. So it's they're not worth your yeah. time anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Let's go into audience questions. Um, the first question we have from the audience is, how do you make weight a non-issue when you are getting intimate? I would love to hear from whoever has thoughts. <laughs> I, I used to think, like, I used to think that if the lights were off or if I was, you know, wearing clothing that suddenly my fat just disappeared. And like, this has been one of those things where I feel like people, you know, like, you're wearing clothes to like hide and you're turning off the lights. But like, that is actually one of the, the most sensual parts of sex is like seeing your partner and moving with your partner. And, you know, I, my husband knows that I am fat. Like there is, it doesn't, it doesn't go away if the lights are off. It doesn't go away if I'm wearing a t-shirt during, during sex. It doesn't make my boobs perkier. Like none of that stuff changes. And for us specifically, that doesn't, that doesn't he would rather have me naked than have me fully clothed you know like he knows my body and something that you said earlier carly that into like that actual like emotional deep emotional connection changes how you feel about being naked and being with your partner because you know that they love you on a level that is completely aside from the size of your body so i i don't think i have an answer where it, i can just tell you that you can just turn that off because your body is always going to be there but understanding that your body is always going to be there was also something that made that a lot easier for me to be like okay well like this is who i am he you know we want to be intimate we're happy being intimate it's not it's not going away i might as well own it and and understand it i actually got a book called um curvy girl sex and it was a life changer for me because it was specifically about sexual positions that work for plus size bodies. So positions that I had never tried before. And it was actually a fun experience for both of us to, to understand my body and what was going to work for us in, in terms of being intimate and and owning the fact that I was a plus size person. So it's it's not about forgetting about it. It's about understanding it and and working with it and you know finding things that work for you and your partner. I love that. I love that. Um, the next audience question that we have is for Luna, and it is how do I feel more comfortable being sexual with my man when I know I look nothing like, nor will I ever look like the women he watches in porn? 
Mm -hmm. That's a really good question because it's so easy to compare ourselves to what our partners are desiring outside of us. And the reality is that lots of us like things to look at. There are, are things that we enjoy that are visually stimulating and it doesn't necessarily mean that's where we're committing or investing or getting emotionally engaged in. And so part one is kind of accepting that our sexuality isn't so simple as like heteronormative, you know, kind of like society has told us that you find one person, you never look at another person ever again. Um, and I, I think step two is is even communicating and just being like, hey, like, you know, do your thing. I just want to tell you, like, I get kind of like anxious about it. And like, maybe yeah. this is something we can open up a conversation about. And so where you're starting a conversation where there isn't the obligation that he has to change this behavior, if that's not what you're concerned about, but it's how you feel about this behavior. And then I think it's also accepting that confidence confidence and doubt can coexist. So we don't have to try and like get on just like 100% on one side. So it is okay if you feel sort of jealous and you go into that insecurity and you're like, damn, like I just don't have the bodies that, you know, he's actually attracted to and then unpack that. So if, if you were in a body that he was attracted to, like what what is gonna happen? Like, are you going to get more love? Are you going to get more desire? And then what's gonna happen if your body changes? I mean, we're all aging except for JLo. And so like, if you're not JLo, then we got to come to this like acceptance around our bodies, like transforming. And do you want a partner or are you going to lose a partner because your body changes? Because that's a really shallow investment then. And we're taking stock again of like, what do we deserve? What am I like? And really coming back always to yourself and then seeing if, if you want to engage somebody else. I love that. Um, next audience question that we have is for Alex. And it is, oh, not it getting away from me. Um, it is, can you talk about how you allow yourself to feel trust? Um, oh, sorry, the chat is going off and I keep losing this question. Let me scroll back up. How do you talk? Oh, I'm already losing it, you guys. I'm very sorry. I'm not being a good moderator right now. <laughs> no, you're great. You're great. <laughs> it says, can you talk about how you allow yourself to feel trust when you are intimate? As a disabled person, I know it can be challenging to feel trust. Yeah, absolutely. And that is one of the biggest things for me is feeling trust with another person. Because I need help getting lifted out of my wheelchair, positioning my body that can move in limited ways. And for that, you really have to trust another human being. Like, really, you're trusting them with your life at that point. Um, and so my safe zone is always my wheelchair. So I think this is really important. My safe zone is my wheelchair. So if I'm in a situation where I'm a little bit apprehensive, I stay in my wheelchair because it's my safe zone. Like I am the safest in my chair always. And to build that trust with someone, I think it really takes getting to know them first. So I would never trust someone the first time I meet them. So like one night stands are pretty off the table for me um, just because to get out of my wheelchair and to have trust in that person, it takes getting to know them and it takes having this level of communication and intimacy to allow them to do that. Um, so I think just really getting to know the person, communicating with them and just trying to have some sort of, like be in a safe space, let your friends know. If you're going to be doing something with someone, um, let your friends know. You know, you need to feel safe. And I feel like safety when you're disabled and getting in an intimate situation is the most important. I absolutely agree on that. Um, the next audience question that we have is, I don't typically enjoy self-pleasure. How do I sexually date myself to increase the self-love? And this is funny because for the longest time, if you haven't followed me on social media, um, you guys would know that last year, literally I like discovered sex toys for the first time, which is crazy because like I have a whole entire sex podcast, but I was really apprehensive because for me, this might be TMI for the panel, but I just don't kind of care at this point, but um, I'm an internally stimulated person versus a lot of females are externally or clitoral stimulated. And so for me, I get, I get stimulated via sex. And so I was like, well, I don't need sex toys. I don't need any of this. And then I came out of relationships for like a total of eight years and I was single for the first time in eight years. 
And I was like, wow, like now I'm not getting sex. I'm not doing any, any of this. What are my options? And I really started to learn little by little and engage more and more with things like sex toys and porn because it allowed me to discover. Now, I didn't necessarily even go outside of my sexual relationships to discover myself when I was in a relationship. And I think that having that time of being single and like not having someone else to, I guess, fulfill my needs was very transformative for me because, you know, I guess in a way, I love how you said this, sexually date myself to increase the self-love. It really gave me that knowledge of what I like, how I like it, what I don't like, maybe necessarily, you know, what is not for me, what is for me. And so the advice I would love to give on this is honestly masturbate more, (laughs) Um, feel your body out, figure out like what you like. And um, I'm sure we've talked about this. A bunch of people actually have talked about this in other panels, but mirror time is fantastic. I don't mean you have to sit there and like masturbate in front of your mirror, but like, I mean, you could if you wanted, but even just getting to know what your body looks like naked and vulnerable. I think that is also a big way to date yourself and, you know, increase that sexual self-love. Cause as soon as you catch yourself in the mirror, like, damn, like, look at me, I'm so hot today. And then you masturbate. Oh my God, it's life changing because you're like, I'm that bitch. So I, that is a, that's a, an answer from me on that one. Um, the, one of the final questions or one of our, one of our final questions is, How do you deal with partners who want to watch porn during sex and constantly struggle to compare yourself to women in the porn? This is a very similar question that we have, but um, this is like a during sex type of thing, not an individual thing. I would love to know everybody's thoughts and opinions on this. Luna, I guess I would love to know this answer from you because I'm sure this is probably something that you and your clients do discuss often. Yeah, I think some people have a challenge with people watching porn at all, but especially when it's in a scenario that it's affecting your ambiance. And so if you're not turned on by the porn too, or you're not turned on by your partner getting turned on by the porn, then it's actually stealing from your pleasure. I mean, so one option is to be like, hey, babe, like, do we have to have this all the time? Like, can we also create like, I think like a sexy playlist or like, can we listen to erotic audio? Can we read each other dirty books? Books, you know, like there's there's so many other ways to stimulate your erotic imagination and penis owners have really also suffered under patriarchy where we've told them that, you know, their all of their excitement and all everything they need to know about sex is from porn and porn is performative and it's entertainment. And so it, it really doesn't do it for everyone. And especially when you're trying to focus on each other. So I might say to my partner, hey, you know, like that's really like, it's so cool to like know what kind of porn you're into. Like, what do you like about this one? Like make it a little bit intellectual so that you're actually delving into their fantasies and how they feel while they're looking at porn. So if they like watching femdom porn while you're having sex, it's maybe they have a fantasy of power. And so can we take that fantasy out of porn and can we do something with it and can we play with power in a certain way can i go down on you while you're blindfolded will that make you feel sort of helpless and you know not as as powerful so i think it's important to have this conversation and not just you know we've we've learned especially as women and femmes that we're just supposed to take it we're just supposed to like you know go along to get along and it feels like conflict or it feels like we're going to make our partners feel rejected and and that's not that's not true when you're speaking up about your needs you're owning your feeling and you're responsible and accountable for your pleasure and then they've got you know their response they're allowed to be a little bit upset they're allowed to challenge you they're allowed to that's all still communication i love that and so final question before ooh, before we, we wrap up our session i would love a quick rapid fire like 15 second answer the question is any advice for getting back into the dating pool in a larger body I will go first with my quick answer. I'm going to say that the biggest thing that I have done to protect my mental health from people who are shitty on dating apps is to use the, um, the unmatched, the, the block, the delete, like whatever it is. I don't need you to be talking all kinds of crazy out your neck in my dating apps. That has, that's really protected my peace when it comes to dating in a not typical body, be that a larger body or a disabled body. Alicia, I would love to know. (laughs) 
who the hell knows? I don't even, I couldn't even imagine being on a dating app right now in general. So I don't, I would be literally lost. But I think that it's super important is, like I said before, is it's not about your body. Like it's, it's not about your body and you need to find ways to make it, your body is going to exist. It is going to be there and just understanding the power that your body actually does have. So owning that, knowing what you want and what you are expecting and setting those boundaries and, and keeping to those as you start to date. Love it. Alex, go ahead. Ed. Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, any advice for getting back into the dating pool in a d different than normal body? Quick 15 second rapid fire answer. Yeah. I just think for me, on um, being disabled, I get loads of weird messages on dating apps. So <laughs> if they think something weird right off the bat about my disability, fetishy, like fuck boy, I'm just like, all right, bye. And I just unmatch. Boundaries. Un Boundaries. Yes. Yeah. Luna, go ahead. Give us your rapid yeah. fire answer. I think you just got to recognize when the audacity is coming at you and I'm on dating apps to be worshipped. And so I put on my crown, polish it, you know, and like, here we go. I love that. Um, so I think that's a wrap for us on the sex and relationships panel. Um, thank you so much everybody for joining us. Thank you guys so much for coming up and speaking on stage with me. You guys are in absolutely incredible people. I'm very happy that we got to speak alongside of each other. Um, we actually are going to head into a break now. So you can either choose a food or snack break or a movement break. Um, for the food break, you'll be joining Emma, the nutritional blonde, or you can go join Brooke for the fully accessible joyful movement break. Brooke will be here on the track stage and Emma will be over on the track two stage and things will get started sh shortly. Um, thank you guys so much again for hanging out with us. I am very happy that we got to do this. I love all you. Thank you so much. You guys can say your goodbyes now. <laughs> Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>